Okay, before starting the lecture, I just would like to know roughly some feedback on the exercise. So, okay, maybe you, you, you had other things to do, but let's say how many people, like first, okay, there have been many hands raised, so several people, I think, look at it. So how many people really tried to do it? At least one, on this, the first, the second, the third. Okay, good. And so how did it go for the first, for the first one? How did you find it? So can you raise your hand if it was okay? Roughly okay. Okay, that's good. The second one, it was harder. The third one, so the third one was really a lot of, let's say, clever algebra. It was not the third one, so somebody tried to do at the end, to the end. Okay, so I think uh, really the, the two import most important ones are is the first and the second. Actually, for the first and the third, I have a solution. I mean, written down. Uh, and for the second, I think, I mean, there are several people that did it. So, I mean, if you type it, then I can look at it. And in general, I will be here. I will work here uh, in the afternoon, during the afternoon. So if you want to discuss about the exercise or the, uh, or the lecture, uh, I'm here. Okay? Okay, so let's start. So today, uh, it's another lecture about rough energy landscape. Uh, so we call it Rough Energy Landscape 2. And uh, so what we are going to do is we are going to study an, another model. And so this model is actually is very rich. And what we are going to get uh, studying its uh, Rough Energy Landscape are properties, are qualitative properties which are valid for many, many other systems. This is why we look at this model because let's say it's the simplest in the class. And uh, so what is the model? So the model is called the P-spin spherical model. So this the Hamiltonian is sum over I1 IP. So this I runs from 1 to big N. Then I have couplings between spins, I1 IP. And then here I have spins, which are actually not really real spins, are what we call spherical spins which means that actually sum over i of si square from 1 to big N is equal to big N, okay? So this means that if you think to S1, S2, Sn as a vector, this vector lives, I mean, belongs to the sphere of in n dimension of radius square root of n, okay? And uh, so in this G, I1, IP are Gaussian random variables. I1, IP are Gaussian random variables, which are identically distributed and independent. And the average of J is equal to 0. And the uh, variance of J is equal to 1 over 2N to the P minus 1. And again, I had, I mean, I had to choose a scaling as yesterday, as I did yesterday for the RAM, since this model is not, a, I mean, you see it's a model in which every spin is connected to any other spin. So in all these cases, I mean, in which you have models like this, which we call mean fin model, or a model defined on, let's say, completely connected lattices, you have to scale the couplings in some way in order to get a good thermodynamic limit. So I already know that the good way to do it is this one. So it's, this is, I mean, you cannot see it like this now, but I mean, if you start to do the computation, then you see that this is the way to take the good scale, the scaling of the variance of the coupling. So are there questions on the model? And what is P exactly? The, the P, okay, so P is a parameter that would be equal, larger or equal to three. Uh, yeah, in principle, I'm very bad with notation, so I always use, but in principle, there is just one P. Which one? This one? Yeah. This one? And this one? Yeah. All the same P. Yeah. Question? So you see, I mean, here I have an Hamiltonian, which is a function of, uh, I mean, of the configuration, and the configuration is the set of S1, S2, Sn, so w now we have continuous variable. We don't have i's and spins like yesterday, okay? So... Tell me if you don't understand the definition of the model, because, I mean, that's the starting point. Okay, so if you don't ask questions, it means that it's fine. So, yeah. Yes, exactly, yeah. 
So you have all the possible P up, up upholes. I don't know how you say it. So I mean S1, S2, S3. S3. I mean you have all the possible. Uh, yeah. Well, I will write it because I don't know how to pronounce it. P, P upholes. Okay. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Yeah, no, so oh, as I said, I mean, uh, when you have models like this in which every degree of freedom is coupled to any other degrees of freedom, you have to scale somehow the coupling with the number of degrees of freedom. This is always in mid-field models. Now, I have, I have to choose this scaling because I know that this scaling is the correct one to have a good thermodynamic limit. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so it's uh, exactly, well, if P is equal to 2, I don't know if this helps. I mean, if you are familiar with the, let's say, sherrington kirkpatrick model, this would be the scaling that you get uh, in that case for the spin glass, infinite model of spin glasses. Okay, so... Okay, let's go. So, well, the first question that you can ask is why on earth we are going to study this model, which actually many scientists uh, uh, actually ask to people working in glassy system. Uh, so there are several reasons. So uh, actually, uh, historically, what happened is that people started to study first model of spin glasses, so mean field model of spin glasses, so which was the case in which P is equal to 2 and the spins are Ising spins. And then, well, when they started to study this model, then they say, well, let's, let's generalize. Let's look to cases in which P is larger than 2. <laughs> and then, well, the case in which P is larger than 2 and you have Ising spins is complicated. So they started also to look to a, most, to a more simple case, which is this one, in which we have spherical spins. And, well, for the moment, it's just, let's say, out of curiosity. But then, I mean, there was really a breakthrough by Kirkpatrick, Tumalai, and Wallidness in the 80s that they, I mean, what they saw is that the property of this model, so the thermodynamics, the dynamics, and the, the property of the rough energy landscape, are actually very, very, let's say, are the ones that they, that they thought are important to explain the glass transition. While we still, I mean, uh, it, the, there is still a debate whether this is correct or not, but this was really a stroke of genius, meaning that, I mean, this model has nothing to do with interacting particles, and however, they understood that all the properties that you find when you study this model are very similar to the one that could be useful, really, to explain uh, supercooled liquids close to the glass transition. And the reason is that the property of the landscape, the statistical property of the landscape, is similar, uh, uh, let's say it's qualitatively, is identical to the one that you, they expected to be right to explain the glass transition. And now, after all this year, we know that actually it's true. So if you solve, uh, let's say, interacting particle system in high dimension, especially in the limit of um, infinite dimension, then the property that you get of the, let's say, rough energy landscape, the thermodynamics and the dynamics, are really the one that you get from this model. So there is a very large university class, and this model is, let's say, the simplest uh, model in this class. And this is why I, I want to present it to you. So of course, there are models which are more realistic, but they won't, I mean, we cannot solve them in, let's say, one hour or one hour and a half, okay? So that's the way to... And then the other thing that I would like to do today is not just to show you what there is in this model, but also to present you a methodology to study rough energy landscape. And this methodology actually... So physicists uh, knew how to, let's say, study the statistical property of rough energy landscape starting from the 80s. So there we are papers by Bray and Moore in the 80s not on this model, but on other model. And then, while well, they use technique, which uh, we, let's say, they are certainly not rigorous, but, I mean, there were, I think, things which were not completely clear, and there are, were things that they were not able to compute, that we are able to compute now. Then, while well, there were many people, and then I think there was a very nice paper, an important paper by Cavagna, Giardina, and Parisi, in 1980, in which they compute, again, very detailed properties about this landscape. 
but again with methods which, well, were, are not, I would say, certainly not uh, under control from the mathematical point of view, and there were still, I think, some questions open. And now, in the recent years, actually, there have been a method, a different method from these two that was developed independently, first by Bray and Dean in 2006, I think, and then by Benarus and our finger in 2010, uh, etc. Okay, so the nice thing is that you will see actually this method is really very direct. In a certain sense, as theoretical physicists, we should have found this one instead of, let's say, the acrobatic one that were studied we found before. And then this method actually now is used in many different contexts, and I will tell you what are the contexts in which it has been used, and I think uh, Gerard Benarus will tell you more about this at the end of the month when he comes here. Okay, so let's, let's go, so let's start. Um, okay, so what we want to do is the same thing that we did yesterday. So we have this Hamiltonian, and what we want to compute are the critical point. So the point at which the gradient is zero. And uh, actually, we want to compute the critical point, uh, uh, so the point at which the gradient is zero. And then as information, we would like to know what kind of critical points are. Are they minima? Are they saddo? And we want to know also what is their energy. Okay? So what we are going to compute is the thing that we defined yesterday, N E D E, which is the number of critical points with energy between E and E plus the E. And what is this? So I will write the equation, and then I will discuss it for you, okay? So I will integrate over all configuration on the sphere, okay? So let's say here on the sphere. And then I will put delta, so which impose that the gradient is zero. So this is actually, well, it's n minus, correspond to n minus one delta, because, I mean, if you are, if you are in the sphere, so the, gradient, the fact that the gradient is zero, it means that the gradient is zero on the plane which is perpendicular to S, okay? Because, I mean, the, my model is defined on the sphere, so the gradient is zero on the sphere, so this corresponds actually to all the components which are perpendicular to S. Then I want to fix that the point S is not just a critical point, so the gradient is zero, but I also want to fix that its energy is E, Actually, it's between E and E plus the E, so I should put a D E here, but okay, I can, so I can put away this D E. And then, well, here I put the delta function of gradient equal to zero, but I think you know, I mean, it's this, uh, if I integrate over S, this will not allow me to count, really, the number of points in which the gradient is zero. I have to add something else, and this something else is the determinant of the Hessian evaluated in S. Okay? So that's the equation, and now I will try to uh, tell you how you get it. Okay? Uh, I think it's, uh, I don't know, I mean, mathematics, I think it goes like, it's the cut rice formula, but, okay, for us, I mean, it's simple. It's a simple generalization of what you can do in one dimension, roughly. Yes? Uh, okay. So because what I want to study is the, um, is what I studied yesterday. So I have a, let's say, random, I have a rough energy landscape. Yeah. And I want to understand, I mean, how is, how is it? I mean, its property. So the first thing is I want to know how many minima I have at a certain energy level. Then I would like also to know at this energy level how many, I don't know, saddles I have. Mm -hmm. So once I have all this information, I will know things about the structure of the energy landscape. And especially if I know the number of energy minima, for example, I can know what, what is the energy of the ground state, if you're interested on the ground state, for example. Yeah? Sorry? So it's... So, I mean, my... So I have an interaction between P spins, where S are, well, we call spins, but are spherical spins. Yeah? There was a question? Why there is one? Ah, sorry. I mean, I, yeah, this is the configuration. Yeah. Is this all the configuration? I'm integrating over all the sphere. Okay. 
Yes. Yes, this is the Jacobian. So let me now explain this equation, okay? And uh, let me do it in one dimension because there is nothing more than one dimension. So imagine that you have a function f of x, which is like this, f of x, and you want to count all the point x in which f of x is zero. Okay? So what do you do? So, well, you can do what I actually, what you can do is the integral over dx of delta f of x and then, yes, then you have to put the, uh, the absolute value of f prime of x. Okay? I don't know if this equation rings a bell, but, okay, there is one way to see it, why it's like this. Uh, or maybe there are two ways to see it. So, what I want to do, actually, so here let's say I have x0 and I have x1. And in this integral over dx, what I would like to have is that this thing here is when x is close to x0, is delta x minus x0, and when x is close to x1, is delta of x minus x1, okay? In this way, when I integrate over x, when if I'm not close to x0 or x1, uh, this will be 0, because, I mean, the delta is 0, because uh, uh, f of x is 0, okay? And when I'm close to this point, I have delta of x minus x0, so when I integrate over x, I get 1, and when I'm close to this point, is delta of x minus x1, so when I integrate... I get one, okay? No, no, wait, wait, wait. We'll see the determinant. They ju just focus on the one dimension and then we go to high dimension. Okay, so in one dimension, okay, so I mean, is this just a change of variable? So you can tell me if it's straightforward for you or not, but I will do it uh, very slowly. So what is delta, delta of x minus x0? What's the difference between delta of x minus x0 and delta f of x? Well, delta f of x, When x is close to x0, I can write it like delta of, well, f in x0 is 0, and then I have f prime of x0 of x minus x0, okay? So you see, I mean, this thing is not delta of x minus x0, okay? And so this term is here is just to count, I mean, the difference between this expression and this expression, okay? It's just a change of variable. In a certain sense, what I'm doing here, I can rewrite like the integral over df of delta of f. Okay. Is it okay or not? Tell me. It's okay for Chris. <laughs> so please, I mean, it's the. Uh, are you lost? Yes. No. Should I go? Yeah. Sorry. I just answer the question. So this is in one dimension. Now you can generalize this in n dimension. So the way to go from here to there, I mean, the easiest thing is. You just go in the basis, the diagonalized the Hessian, and then you have uh, n minus 1, the same one-dimensional problem. So that's the so way to... My question is, our delta is only here in the rather perpendicular direction. Yeah, yeah. Is it important? Yeah, so is this the determinant in the, on, the, on the plane? Yeah. yeah. Okay, can I go? So what we want to do now is to compute this. Can I go? What? What we do? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So I, 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 what I'm going to do is I compute this, and then tomorrow I will show you also how you can get the thermodynamics, how you can add the temperature on this. For the moment, for today, there is just the property of the land, energy landscape, not free energy landscape. Yes? What is it? Yeah, I mean, this is in one dimension. If you got it in one dimension, I mean, in n dimension, it's just the same. And the way to do it is that you take this equation, you go in the basis that diagonalize the Hessian, so you just change, uh, you just do a transformation, and then it's just uh, like the one-dimensional problem. Be because of this? Yeah, but this is, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree, but this is just something that I add. I mean, the, the difficult part is this one and this one. Yeah, yes, yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Can I go? Yes. So, okay, let me, yeah, so I think uh, I didn't explain well for, uh, so here I have spins, so I mean, so I call it spins, these are just real variables, S, S, I, 1, S, I, P. Now I can pack, so this, uh, so my configuration, C, is S, 1, S big N, and this one I will represent it as a vector, S, okay? Then here in the couplings I have, so let me do an example. So H will be minus J of 1, 2, 3, S1, S2, S3, minus J of, I, I don't know, 1, uh, 5, 100, of S1, S5, S100, etc. Okay? So this i index, so this, all this i runs from, as I say, from 1 to big N, okay? So it means that here I can have all the possible, uh, I mean, triples, okay? So I have 1, 2, 3, uh, 4, 5, 6, uh, 5, 6, uh, 100, etc. So the i here runs, uh, let's say, i is the, like the, uh, um, is the uh, index of the degrees of freedom. Yes, I can say I, J, K, yeah. Yes. No, because, I mean, everybody interacts with everybody else, so there is no lattice structure. I mean, that, that's the equation. So you don't choose, I mean, it's, you just sum over all possible I1 IP. So it means that if, when you do the sum, you will have all the possible, I mean, uh, pupils, okay? Oh. Yeah, I also put self-interaction, but because, I mean, it's, the fact is that it's subleading. So again, all the things is the dominant contribution here, and if I have, I can, I just put it just to be, I mean, I can, I can put it or not, and just to, be, to simplify the computation, I, I leave the self-interaction. But it's not a big deal, it doesn't change anything. Other questions? Okay. Okay, so this is the thing that I want to compute, and actually what I will compute is not this, but it's the average of this. So I take this average like yesterday, this is the average over the disorder. The disorder are the quench coupling J, okay? So here I take the average. And exactly as we did yesterday for the RAM, the things that work yesterday for the RAM work also in this case. It means that when, this, so when I compute this, and I will tell you more again uh, later after the computation, when this is, um, uh, goes to zero exponentially fast in N, then it means that there, is, there are no solutions with probability one in the large N limit the same thing that Chris just said before. And instead, when instead this one diverge the, uh, so exponentially with n, actually the average value is a, good, uh, is a good description of the typical value. It doesn't always work, but in this case it works. Okay? Why does it work? Why is the annealed structure? Because I think it's the, uh, the critical point I really throw at random on the sphere. So the overlap between the critical point is zero. And, uh, and in practice, okay, this is, well, it's for Chris. I mean, you can compute the second moment and show that everything, okay? So let's go now. I want to show you the computation. So I will not do all, really all, all the, comput the computation in all details, but I will do, I will show you why it's, easy, why it's doable. And it can be easy done in three steps. So there is one first step, one first step, which is rotation invariance. Oh, 
Okay. So, as you see, here I have an average that I can, when I can flip with the integral, so I would put the average here, okay? And when I do the, I put the average here, what is this? In words, is the probability that S is a critical point. Uh, with energy E, okay? And now what I want to show you is that this probability does not depend on S, okay? So it's uniform on the sphere. So the probability that, uh, I don't know, uh, well, the North Pole is a critical point with energy E is exactly equal to the probability that, I don't know, the South Pole uh, is a critical point with energy E, okay? So let's go. And so this, uh, so what I want to show you is that this, uh, I will call it just P of S, okay? It's just the part which is on the right of the integral. P of S is, let's say, equal to P of 1 for any S. And 1 is the configuration in which I have 1, 1, 1, okay? So in this sense, it is rotational invariant. And if this is the case, you see that there, we did already a first step of the computation. Because what we have is that we have integral over ds, p of s, but p of s does not depend on s. So this is just the integral over ds, where s is on the sphere, times p of 1. Okay? And so, while well, the first part is nothing else that is, this, is the surface of the sphere in n dimension, of a sphere which has a radius square root of n, and then I have p1, okay? That's the first part of the computation. Why is this? Well, it's because here I'm integrating s on the sphere. The sphere is in n dimension because I have i which goes from 1 to n, and the radius of the sphere is square root of n because, well, from this, okay? Okay, so now I want to show you that this is true. This does not depend on s. So how am I going to do it? So this is, well, I, 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 I will give you the idea, but I will not do all the computation. So the idea is, when you try to do this computation, which is here, what you get is that, for example, in the Hamiltonian, H, the Hamiltonian is minus sum over I1, IP, J I1, IP, S I1, S IP. Okay? So now let's call O, the, ortho the orthogonal matrix that brings S to the pole north, to the north pole, okay? So in, I will write it like this. What it, this means is sum over, uh, let's say, J, O I J, S J equal to one, okay? And O is an orthogonal matrix, so O, o transpose is equal to the identity, okay? I ju just bringing S onto the north pole. Now, Okay, um, yeah, maybe I should have, I should have written, okay, so let's, uh, well, let me define this with a transpose. Yeah, just a moment. In such a way that S, I will write S like O1. Yeah. So when you say sum over S and O S, are you saying O is part of This one? This one, so I mean just the vector applied to the matrix is equal to, to the vector one. So o, so o, o is the orthogonal matrix that when I multiply this orthogonal matrix to S, bring S to the North Pole. Yeah, I just choose one. It's just the just rotation that brings S in, in one, okay? Okay, so while I actually, this I will call it the transpose, so O is the one that brings me, that brings 1 into S. When I do this, so I, here I just, so the idea is that, it, I mean, in all, when I do the computation, each time that I have G or S, now I can replace S by the orthogonal matrix time 1. So I will have J I1 IP or I1 I1 bar or IP, IP bar, okay? And they have also the sum over 
I1 IP bar. Okay? Uh, okay, yeah. Times one, exactly. So let me put it this way, in this way. Times one, okay? Are these all different? No, they are all the same because all the, I mean, uh, what, what I have, I, I have O is defined for the vector S. The vector S goes to the no pole, okay? So what I have here now, imagine that I call all this thing, I will call it J prime, okay? So I will write this like minus sum over I1 bar, IP bar of J I1 bar IP bar prime 1. Okay? I just redefine all this like a big coupling, which is applied now to what? To a vector, which is the vector 1. Okay? So now, the trick, I mean, the trick, uh, the fact is that if the probability law of this g vector g pr of these couplings g prime is the same probability law of this coupling j. What I'm computing here, when I, I do this all this change, at the end is nothing else than p of one. Okay, because when I compute p of one, well, what I have I in all the expression I will have things like sum over i one i p j, and then I have one here. Okay, so what I'm just saying is that well, if I redefine this like the new coupling, if the new coupling has exactly the same distribution that the old coupling, then, well, the problem is exactly the same. I'm computing P1. Is the idea clear? This is something that, I mean, in uh, spin glasses, people sometimes call gauge invariance. I mean, it's a big word for something simple. I'm just doing a change of variable, okay? So let me, well, tell me if you understood the idea. Then there is the computation which is showing that this has the same statistical properties of J. Yeah? Yes, I agree, but yeah, I'm trying just to, uh, yeah. No, so I mean, what I'm saying here is that if I start with, when I compute P of S, I can rewrite S like orthogonal matrix applied to 1, and now I can interpret this as a new coupling, a new problem in which I have a new coupling, uh, J prime, which is J with this, all this orthogonal matrix, and then here I have the vector 1. Now, if this new coupling are distributed exactly like the old coupling, now it's like the old problem in which S is equal to 1. Uh? Yes, yeah, 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 okay. Well, I mean, it's, uh, what, what I mean is that now the only thing to do is to prove that, I mean, to show that this has the same statistical distribution of J. But that's the way to do it. It's the way to go, okay? So if you understood this, then the rest is just clever algebra. I mean, it's nothing, but that's the idea. So did you get did you get the idea? Okay. So let's now. I mean the uh, uh, the proof so to show that this has the same distribution of J. I will I will just sketch it. I think. Um, and this really this is something that you can do easily by yourself. Uh, so what is J prime? So J prime, and let me use this notation. So J prime is equal to J O O O P times. Okay. I'm not putting all the indices on which I sum. Okay. Like in vectors. Okay. So now, what is the probability of J of all the J is the product over all i1 ip exponential of minus J i1. Sorry. Let me do it this way. It's minus sum over I1 IP, J I1 IP square divided by 2. Then here I have to put the variance that, if you remember, was uh, 1 over 2 and P minus 1. And then I have a normalization factor in front. Okay? 
Now, if I want to look at what is the probability of J prime, so there are two things that I have to do. So I have to look at the Jacobian, and I have to look at how this transforms when I change J to J prime. Okay? And now the thing which is simple is, okay, let's see the Jacobian. So the Jacobian, again, I will, not, I will do it fast, but the Jacobian in principle, when I go to, so dj prime is equal to dj times, if you do the computation, is the determinant of O, determinant of O, t times, okay? You just have to do it, but I mean, that's the idea. And since this is an orthogonal matrix, all this is one. So this goes away, so there is no Jacobian. And then this one, well, same thing. So here, I, let me put it this way. This, if I don't put the indices, is nothing else than JJ, okay? And JJ, well, I can rewrite it like J prime, O transpose, O transpose, O, J, okay? And then, well, I have just to pack together the orthogonal matrix, and so I will get J, sorry, this was J prime. So we'll get J prime, J prime, okay? So that's the idea. Then you have to put the indices and do it uh, slowly, but, I mean, there is nothing difficult, okay? Okay, good. So we did, that. We did the first step. So the first step is uh, that now we know that we have just to compute P1. So now let's compute P1. Let's see what is P1. So this uh, is P1. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, this was the... Uh, this would be the Hamiltonian evaluated in uh, the configuration one with coupling J prime, and the coupling J prime has this the same statistical distribution of, of J. Yeah. I have a quick question. O is an n by n matrix, right? Yes. J is a vector of length P. Yeah, so this is why, so this, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, in the, with this notation here, I have that, you see, this index is related to this, and then I have I2, which is related to the other O, so it's a very compact notation, yeah. I mean, how do you multiply O by J? Uh -huh. You want that I put all the indices? So, I mean, it's the, the fact, well, oh, oh, the let's, the yeah, I didn't put indices just because otherwise the equation is like this, and this is something that you can do. Yeah? Okay, vector J is a tensor of rank. Yeah. 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 So Yes, I mean, it's J, J uh, 1, 2, 3 is not J 3, 2, 1. They are different. Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's, again, it's, it's really not a big deal. It's just that we have a lot of indices. I mean, it's, yeah. Exactly. It's what, it's, yeah, it's, I agree. It's what I, I try to say that, and when I say that I don't put the indices. Yeah. I s <laughs> but I, yeah. I mean, it's just a way to, I mean, I, I'm just not putting the sum. And so J square is just the sum over I1 IP of J I1 IP square. Okay. So let's, I mean, really, trust me, I mean, there is no big deal. You just put the indices and you find, I mean, once you know these two things, you do it, you check the Jacobian and you check this. You just do the change of variable and you will find that J, I mean, this thing will be equal to the sum over I1 IP of J prime I1 IP square and that the, there is no Jacobian, okay? Okay, so now let's, let's compute P1. Tensor full of independent Gaussian entries, then that distribution is fixed under applying an orthogonal transformation to any one of its uh, indices. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what we want to compute now is the gradient evaluated in one in the orthogonal direction, and then we have the determinant, and then we have delta of H of S, H, H1, everything is evaluated in one, minus E, okay? Now let's look 
to what are all and then I have the average okay so let's look what what are these things which are here which are inside the delta or, or in the action so let's look to this one for example what is the gradient so this is so let me write first the gradient in the normal space okay not in the uh, orthogonal to uh, to the sphere so I have just dh dsi evaluated in s equal to 1 okay and so what is this is minus the sum over i1 ip sorry uh, yeah we put it no i2 ip of j i i2 ip of s i2 s ip then plus j of i 2 i uh, i 3 ip s i 2 s ip plus blah 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 j i 2 ip i s i 2 s ip everything is evaluated in s equal to 1 ok yeah No, is the uh, what is orthogonal is so I have the sphere, I have S here, and I have the plane which is orthogonal to S. So I'm evaluating the gradient okay, in so the it's plane. Tangent to the sphere. Sure, it's a tangent it's tangent to the sphere and is orthogonal to S. Okay, yeah. okay. So now let's see so what is oops. So what is this thing? Yes. So which one? All these terms? Just what they, what they need. Okay, so this one is the gradient. This one. So I just take the derivative. I'm just computing the gradient. So actually I'm doing the gradient along direction i is the derivative of h, the Hamiltonian, with respect to s i. And here I just took the derivative. Okay, so when I take the derivative of the Hamiltonian, so since I have s i1 to s i p, so well, I can just uh, I mean once I take uh, the I one which should be equal to I uh, etc. So I have p terms. Okay, when I evaluate this in s equal to one, I have minus some I two I p of this thing J I I two I p plus J I two I p I. Okay. Okay. So now what you see here is something which is interesting and this is going to happen for all the variables so if for this for this for the gradient for the action and for the energy what do i have here so what are j's what are the j's are gaussian random variable right so what i have here actually i mean now it looks much less terrifying the computation in the sense that what i have here is this is these are gaussian random variables this is another Gaussian, I mean, other set of Gaussian random variable, and this is a Gaussian random variable. So in order to compute this, I have just to understand how these Gaussian random variables are correlated. And then I have almost the solution. And uh, so the only thing that we have to do now is to compute the covariances of all the Gaussian random variables. Okay? Is it okay for everybody? I sum Gaussian random variable, I get a Gaussian random variable. So here I have just a bunch of Gaussian random variables and I have to compute their covariance to get the law. And then I can do this average very easily. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, I will not compute all the covariances because they are annoying, but actually uh, the, you will see that it's, it, they are extremely simple actually, these this, uh, this covariances. So let's compute just one. So again, I have the sphere here. I have one, the North Pole. I have the, the plane, which is orthogonal. And then uh, let's say that I mean I have here a reference frame. So let's say that I consider, for example, uh, I mean in this reference frame, I have vector v alpha. And well, let's consider one of them. Let's let's see the gradient along the direction v of alpha. Okay, and I will call it this f of alpha. And what I want to compute now if f of alpha, f of beta. So how the gradients are correlated in the different direction along the plane. Okay? So what is f of alpha? Well, it's just sum over i of bi alpha dh 
dSi. So is what I wrote there is minus sum over I1 IP, J I1 IP, and then I have V alpha I1 plus, so then I have a bunch of one, plus J I1 I2 IP, V I2 alpha, plus blah, 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 J I1 IP, V IP of alpha, this is F, F of alpha, okay? I just, I mean, just multiply what I have here by V of I alpha and I sum over I. V alpha is one, exactly, yeah, it's, yeah, what I, what I, I have a reference frame on, on my plane and my V alpha is just one of the uh, uh, unique vector uh, of my reference frame. Okay. I know that this is hard and it's actually is the hardest thing that I will going, I'm going to teach you from, it, uh, from the point of view of methodology, but I think it's, you, you, you can get it. I mean, even though there are some details which are, which are difficult, okay? Okay, so now let's compute F alpha, F beta. Now F alpha, F beta, average. Well, I have just to take this, and then I1, uh, IP, J I1 IP, then I have V I1 alpha plus V I P alpha, and then I have to multiply this by the same, the, the same thing, let's say L1 LP, I use other indices for the other one, J L1 LP, V L1 beta plus blah blah blah, V L P beta. Yes. Yes, I, well, if you want, I can call it I. I mean, it's just a dummy variable. So uh, you're right. I mean, if I, I can call it I1. Okay. So now look at this. So the J are, ident I mean, are in, uh, independent Gaussian variables. So when I take the average, I mean, they have to couple, otherwise I, get, otherwise I get zero, okay? So this thing will be equal to sum over I1 IP. I have to couple the indices, otherwise I get zero, okay? I remem remember, I mean, this, so yep. Ah, uh, yes, sorry. So let me see if I do it. Uh, uh, so let me let me be consistent. So I, the way in which I wrote it there is J I two. Uh, yes. No, I think it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, it's true that I, I I probably change indices along the way. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean it's I mean it's correct. The only thing is that here I call I two. What well, there I call I1. But, uh, so what I mean is that I take V, and now V is the second element of this brother. And then it's just to... Yeah. So now I take the average, so I have to couple this to this, and then I get sum over I1 IP, then I have G I1 IP square average, and then I have these two that I have to couple in principle, okay? And now, um, so let's do it. So you see that what I have here, so, so let me maybe replace this first. So this J square I1 IP, we know what it is. It's just one over two to the NP minus one, okay? And then I have these things that I have to multiply. So look at what happens when I have this times this, okay? When I have this times this, what I get, I get V I1 alpha, V I1 beta. Then I have terms like, then I have all these terms like this until this one. So I have plus blah, 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 P times V I P alpha, V I P beta, okay? And then I have all the cross product, okay? In which I have things like 
V, for example, I will have V I1 alpha, uh, V I2 beta, okay, plus blah, 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 okay? Tell me if you, if you get it. So I have, when I multiply this, I have these terms. So the first with the first, the second with the second, the P with, the, with I mean, the last with the last, and then I have all the diagonal terms, okay? And now the fact is that... So, so when I go from this to this, first I have this sum and this sum, but actually this sum, this, in this, this index has to be equal to this one, because otherwise uh, I get zero, because these variables are, are independent. So this is why I, get, I put just this. And since I put this, all the S L1, LP are I1, IP. And then I have just to take the square of this with L1, which is equal to I1, and LP, which is equal to IP. And when I take the square, so I have two different kinds of terms. I have these terms in which I have first with the first, second with the second, or last with the last. And then I have the terms in which I have, I don't know, the first with the second, and uh, so the second on this with the first of the other one. Okay? And now, Yeah, sorry. Say it again. Why yeah. I1 is equal to Why this should be equal to this? Yeah. Because the uh, so the couplings J are so the J are Gaussian so I, I ID variable. So it means that J I1 IP is uncorrelated with J L1 LP if all the indices are different. Okay? So this is equal to zero except if, so I1 is equal to L1, IP is equal to LP. Okay. This gives us a delta function, basically. This gives a delta function, yeah. Okay. So, so now, when I do this sum, so it's look at, there are two different type kinds of terms. So I have one over, I rewrite here, I have one over two to the n p minus one, and I have p times a term which is which comes from this, okay, I have p times the same thing, in which I have actually what I get is sum over i let's say b i one alpha, b i one beta. And then I have three sums here, like sum over i two, sum over i p, and then I have uh, one over two to the n to the p minus one. Okay? And I have p times this thing, and then I have 1 over 2 to the np minus 1, and then I have terms like sum over, let's say, i1, vi1 alpha, sum over i2, vi2 beta, and I have different many terms like this, okay? Okay? And now, well, what happens, remember, this v alpha are just my reference plane on the plane, okay? So this is equal to... Is delta alpha beta, exactly. And this instead, remember we are on the plane which is orthogonal to the North Pole. So it's zero, right? Because this is nothing else than V alpha scalar product with one, and this is nothing else than V beta scalar product with one. Okay? So all these terms goes away. So at the end, the only thing that I wanted to show you is that f alpha f beta is simple. What it is, is, so here I have, you see, I have three sums. How many three sums I have? p minus 1. So all this is just equal to n to the p minus 1. So it goes away with n p minus 1, which is here. And so what I have is that f alpha f beta is p divided by 2, delta alpha beta. At the end, it's very simple. Uh, no, this one? No, it's not equal to 1. So what I'm saying is that this term is the scalar product of V with the null pole. But V, remember, we have the sphere, we have this plane which is orthogonal to the north pole, and the alpha are vector on this plane. So the scalar product is 0. This is V alpha dot 1, yeah. 
Okay, so let so if you do now all the other computation and again, I mean, it's, there is really nothing difficult. You have, I mean, it's just tedious. You will you will discover that the statistics of all these things is very simple. So f alpha f beta, which are the gradient on the on the plane, are actually are Gaussian uh, variable which are uncorrelated with variance which is p divided by two. Then h, which is the other thing, is the uh, is the energy. Well, we know h square is equal to uh, n divided by two. I mean, this you can do it. It's easy. I will not do it. And the, other, the interesting thing is that actually h is independent from f alpha. Okay. So for the moment, I have a bunch of independent Gaussian random variable. This one with variance p divided by two and h with variance n divided by two. And then now there is the Hessian. Uh, so the Hessian here is the other uh, Gaussian variable that we have to compute. And now the, the Hessian gradient, so I will write it in, not on the plane, because otherwise uh, it's a mess. I will write it just on the uh, I mean normal reference frame. So what one can show is that this one is nothing else that GIJ, which are Gaussian independent, identically distributed random variable, minus P. Sorry, say it again. No. Well, so H is, is the is 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 contains the coupling J. So it's in principle could be correlated with the f of alpha, which contains the coupling J. Ah, sorry. Um, yeah, uncorrelated. Ah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I I, no, I didn't have the coffee this morning. Uncorrelated from f alpha. Yeah, what I mean, sorry, if I use the the wrong term. So all these variables are uncorrelated Gaussian random variable. Yes. Exactly. F alpha H is equal to zero. Yeah. Sorry. Huh? Uh, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay, and then the Hessian is almost simple, not completely. So it's something which is Gaussian independent uh, and, uh, sorry, Gaussian uncorrelated random variable. And then is a little bit correlated with H. And the but the correlation I can extract it easily. So it means that I have this part which is just uh, uncorrelated, and I have a, a part which is just correlated with the energy. Okay. And so in the GIJ are uncorrelated, and you can compute their variance. So GIJ square is equal to p p minus one divided two n, and then the GII so the diagonal element are p p minus one divided up by n, okay? So just the variance of diagonal is just this, twice the variance of the off-diagonal. Otherwise, they are uncorrelated, okay? <laughs> and now, this is very nice, actually, because this kind of matrix is very, very well known. It's called a random matrix, which, co which belongs to the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. So more or less, we know everything about the property of this matrix, okay? But so for the moment, the, f the thing that I wanted to show you is that this at the beginning looks like, I mean, a difficult beast, but actually almost everything is uncorrelated here, okay? So to compute that, we would just like take the second derivative and then hateful it would exactly. and compute Exactly. 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 Nothing difficult is just painful. Just can yeah. we handle the delta functions with the Fourier trick? Is that we, for the moment, I didn't do anything on the delta function. Okay. So now that I know this, let's compute one more step of but this but average. By the way, point about the uh, rotation variance. variance also tells us that the gradient along the particular direction yes. and the same are dependent. It's not uncorrelated for the same reason. Yeah. Because I think so. in, yeah. in n dimensions, there's n minus 2 dimensional rotation. Yes, I agree. Further further yeah. Further. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So now that I know this, let's try to compute a little bit more this 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 term, and you will see there is already something which comes out. 
So what is this average? Well, it's simple actually. So the, the average here, and I have to average over all these variables. So we'll have the product over alpha from 1 to n minus 1 of exponential of minus f alpha square divided by 2. Then I put the variance, p divided by 2, and then square root of 2 pi p divided by 2. So this is the just the Gaussian variable for, for f alpha. Then I have the energy. So, so okay, here I have df alpha. Then I have the h. And I have minus h square divided by 2, n2, square root of 2 pi n2. Okay? So I, I, so I, I want to write this. So maybe let me, let me put some space. So I'm just, I'm just writing what is the average. So when I average, I have to integrate over all the values of f alpha and h. Uh, and then I have also the gij, okay? And this I will not write. I will just write in this way, okay? dpgij. Let me just be compact, okay? And now I have to put all the delta functions. So now the del let's put all the delta functions. So what is the all this delta function here? It's just the product over alpha of delta f alpha. The gradient has to be zero in the, pla in, the, in the plane orthogonal to S. Then I have this delta function here, which is delta of H minus T. Okay. And then, well, there is still the determinant to compute, which is the determinant of a matrix, which is Gij minus T. And then here is H divided by N. But because there is a delta function here, this is nothing else that E I mean, it's E divided by N, okay? So let's stare at this equation. So what I put, uh, so let me tell again what I did. So I have this average. This, I have its average over this random variable. I compute what is the probability distribution of the random variable. And I know that the F alpha are uncorrelated Gaussian. So this is their probability distribution. H is a Gaussian variable and correlated with, uh, I mean, with the F alpha. So here is its probability distribution. And then I have the Gij. Well, uh, I should write all the Gaussian for the Gij also, but I will not do it because there is no more space. And then here I still, I still have the uh, determinant. Okay? That's good. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there was still a term that, but for the moment, let's focus on this, then we put everything. So this, for the moment, is just this, okay? Now let's do the integral. So there are the integral over d alpha, well, it's very easy, I have a delta function. So, well, I just have to put f alpha equal to zero here, okay? So the integral over all f alpha will give me square root of two pi, p divided by two, to the power n minus one, okay? This just comes from this. And then I have to integrate over h. I have a delta function. h should be equal to e. So we'll get e exponential of minus e squared divided by big N. OK, and then there is square root of pi n. OK. And then I have the last term, which I will still write it in this way. So it's the average over just the gij now of the determinant of gij minus p small e, because it's intensive energy, times, sorry, here I should have put a d, delta j, okay, delta j. So let me write it without put the indices, so this is the matrix G, and here I have the identity, the identity matrix. Okay. Mm. So this was the second step. Then there is the third step. Uh, so we have, you see, I mean, we are just computing bits of this big thing. So first we had the volume of the, uh, sorry, the, the surface of the sphere. Now we have this term, which is easy, I mean, which is simple after all. And now we have to compute this. So there is one remark which is interesting, is that uh, when we did this computation, we realized that the uh, gradient is uncorrelated from the Eschen, if I fix the energy. So what this means actually is that if I look to 
a critical point which has a given energy, so the Hessian of this critical point will be the same of the Hessian of a typical point which is not, which is not cri a critical point. What I mean is that, I mean, if I know that the point is critical, this doesn't tell me anything new about, about the Hessian, if I fix the energy, okay? Because the gradient is uncorrelated from the Hessian. So this means that, I mean, the, uh, uh, the Hessian of a point with energy E is exactly the same of the Hessian of a critical point with energy E, okay? Because they are uncorrelated, okay? I don't know if we went through. I mean, this was just a remark. Okay, so now we have to compute this last term. And this last term, we are not really going to compute it. And this is the easy thing. So let me do it here. Okay, so the, the last term is the... So I have this matrix G minus P E times the identity. Okay, now this matrix G actually is very well known and is, well, it's a random, random matrix. And from this matrix G, let's say that I know the eigenvalues, which I will call lambda alpha, okay? Now, what are the eigenvalues of all this matrix here? If I know the, 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 the eigenvalue of, of G, what are the eigenvalues of this? Exactly, it's lambda alpha minus PE. And now, so what I want to compute is the determinant of G minus PE identity. What is this? It's just the average of the product over alpha of lambda alpha minus PE. Absolute value, okay? So let me introduce now the density of eigenvalues of the matrix J. So rho lambda, which is one over N, sum over alpha, of delta lambda minus lambda alpha. Okay? So I rewrite this like the average of the exponential of sum over alpha of log lambda alpha minus PE, which then I rewrite like exponential of n, the integral over d lambda, rho lambda, of log of lambda minus PE. Okay? Yes? Bigger? Yeah. So I should rewrite? Yeah. Okay, now from now on I will write. So let me just tell you again. So this uh, absolute value of the determinant, I rewrite like the product over all the eigenvalue of, their, of the absolute, val absolute value of lambda alpha minus PE. Then I put this in the exponential with the log. And then the sum over alpha I rewrite like an integral over or d lambda and rho lambda, where rho lambda is the density of eigenvalue. And now the f funny thing is that rho lambda actually fluctuates almost no, I mean fluctuates very, very little. And so little that this actually is equal to exponential of n integral over d lambda, average of rho lambda, log of lambda minus p. Okay? And now, well, let me, I, even if I'm a bit late, I would like to tell you why it fluctuates so little. Because, I mean, this is very general. Because in principle, I mean, what I'm showing you here for the spherical p-spin can be done in many other cases. So what I did is that I took the average, which is in the exponential, and I put it up. So I replace the row, which is here, with its average value. And I can do this because this row fluctuates so little that is almost always equal to its average, at least if I want to compute this, okay? And why is this the case? Yeah. So now what is known, and uh, so this is a general result that I'm telling you, and which actually uh, it's the thing that I would like to give you as an exercise, actually it's more a challenge, uh, in random matrix theory, is that, I, I mean, what is known is that the probability to observe a certain row of lambda, in general, I mean, for random matrices like this, has an expression which is called a large deviation function, 
which is exponential of n squared times the functional of rho of lambda. Okay, so, and the only important thing is that here you get the n squared. Okay, so this means that, yeah, this p of rho of lambda is extremely peaked, and if you want to take something which is not equal to the average, then you have to pay, how much you have to pay, exponential of n squared. And instead, there, what we are computing is something which you have exponential of n. Okay? And this is why I can just put the average inside. And to understand why it's so, I mean, yeah, you can do an exercise. Just take one variable, x. This, let's say the p of x is equal to exponential of n squared, a certain function of f of x. Okay? And then try to compute x. Well, the average of x will be the integral over dx of exponential of n squared f of x, x. So this will be equal to the maximum of f. Okay? And this I can do because, I mean, this is so strongly picked that this, I mean, the integral will give me, give me x max. But now if I compute something which is like exponential, let's say, of n of h of x, so I have the n here, which is something similar to what we are, sorry, this is too small. So, so if I compute something which is exponential of n and the function of h of x, so this would be the integral of dx of exponential of n square f of x, exponential of n h of x. But again, I mean, here I have an n, here I have an n square, so this is the one that wins. And so this is always equal to exponential of n of h of x max, which is nothing else than exponential of n of f of the average of x. Okay? So, the, I, mean, all the, I mean, at the end, all the important part is that the fluctuation of rho of lambda in random matrix theory are governed by a large, what is called a large deviation function in which you have an n square here. That's the only thing that matters. Ah, yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, sorry. It's n square because they are n square. So why is an n square? Uh, is it, uh, well, I mean, it depends on the scaling. I mean, it's difficult to get, but I mean, what I, I gave you, I, I prepare for you, even if you don't hate me after all this math, which is probably likely, is, uh, so I prepare a challenge, which, so it's not an homework. You do it, you can do it now, or you can do it, I don't know, later during the uh, summer school. It's about, I mean, deriving this explicitly and deriving a lot of property with run of random matrix theory. And uh, you can do it just using things like Langevin equation. And it's very nice. It's called the Dyson Brownian motion. So you have an exercise there. Uh, it will take some time, and I suggest you to do it in reading groups. But there is a reward, and the reward is that the most beautiful computation that you can do in random matrix theory. And once you get, and also the, I mean, that this technique of Dyson Brownian motion is something which uh, now is the basis of a lot of recent results uh, that have been derived in recent years in random matrix theory. So if it's important that you get it, I think. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, the yes, I mean, the electrostatic is, let's say, is the, uh, is the equilibrium distribution of the, uh, the stochastic process that is related to the Dyson Brown motion. Yeah. If I order and think about a fixed here, yeah. and think about a fixed there, I order and think about a fixed there, I order and think about a fixed there, this is uh, so since G I J are real variable, so we are looking to G O E. The large deviation function is only true for G O E. Uh, the, the, the n square is true also in the other case. I mean, the, the explicit thing here is depends if you do G O E, G U E, or other things. But the n square is general. Yeah. Okay. So now let me uh, put everything together and give you some images of, of the results. So let me, uh, so at the end, we finally, we finally got the uh, N of E average. What is this? So there is the first part here, which was the uh, surface of the sphere in N dimension of radius square root of N. I mean, this is really, so remember, what we are interested in is just the 
ex I mean, we want to know this to an accuracy which is exponential in n. Okay, so you don't need to know this exactly. You just want to know how this behaves when you plug it in the exponential when it's I mean to the exponential accuracy. Okay, this I won't, won't do the computation for you. You can do it by yourself. You can look to Wikipedia. I mean it's really everywhere. It's not a big deal. Uh, so this term will be exponential of. Oh, we can also derive it together this afternoon. It, it takes three lines, but I don't think. Uh, three useful lines now. Um, yeah, that's it. I think. Uh, minus, uh, no. Plus n divided by 2. Okay. So there is this first term, which is the surface of the sphere. Then there is all this normalization, which are here. So which give me, so this one will give me plus, uh, no, mi mi minus n, uh, one half log of 2 of pi p, okay, which come from here. And then I have minus uh, n p square, which come from here. And then from this term, I get I get uh, plus n integral of d lambda rho lambda of, uh, so is this the average rho lambda, of lambda minus p e. You tell me if I'm forgetting something. I think it's uh, okay. And now, what is this average of rho of, of lambda? This is known. And again, if you do the exercise, you will derive it by yourself. And this is what is called the semicircular law, the Wigner semicircle. So it's like this. And uh, it goes from minus. So I mean, with the since the g, the Gaussian, I mean, the variable g are have a variance which was p, p minus one divided by two. So I mean, it's here we will get p p minus one divided by two square root of p p minus one divided by two, and this is the Wigner semicircle, okay, which is uh, square root of should be p p minus two divided by two minus lambda square, and then there is a normalization in front. Mm. Okay. Okay, so now, well, we have this expression. So I, I show you how you compute all this, this expression, and now I would like to tell you what, I mean, the physics that there is inside it. Okay? So in principle, now you are, I mean, you have everything explicit. You say what is the energy, you plug it in here, and then you plug it in here, you compute this stuff, and you have, sorry, there is no this normalization, sorry. Yeah, because, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so now let's discuss the physics related to this. So if you, if you plug all the things in, oops, the board. Yeah. So what we want to compute to show you now is the n of e, the average n of v, as a function of e, small e, okay? And actually, more than this, actually, I will show you the entropy, like, like for the rem, okay? So this is the curly n, which is the number of critical point, and this is the number of degrees of freedom. So what you get is that you get something which is like this, okay? This value here is the, is the ground state value. Depends, of course, on the model, on the P that you consider. And exactly as for the RAM, here you know that there are no configuration. Because here the average value is exponentially small. And then if you want, I don't think you want now, but if you want, you can compute n square, the variance, and then and show exactly for the rem that actually this, the average value is also the typical value. So this is really what you get for a typical system, okay? This is the first thing, but now there is, there is more, uh, there are other things which are interesting. So what are the other things? So first thing is here now I can look to what is the Eschen, what is the density of eigenvalue of the Eschen of the ground state, let's say. 
And what I get is that the row of lambda, because it's shifted, is a semicircle which is shift, is actually like this. Okay? So I have all the eigenvalues which are positive, and the semicircle is shift. Then, if I move here, uh, so let me change, well, I don't change color. So if I move here, then I get that the semicircle, so I go out to higher energy, so the semicircle actually shift toward the left. And then at a certain point, when I arrive here, I will get that the semicircle will just touch the edge, which means that now all the eigenvalues are positive, but there are some flat direction. Okay, so this means that here, if I look to critical point, so the critical point is where are minima, there are few, and they are well stable because they are here. When I, I come here, typically critical points are still minima, but they are a little bit less stable. And when I arrive here, which is called the threshold, the threshold energy, the, uh, the critical points are marginally stable because you have some flat direction. And if you, if you come here, actually, well, if you come here, actually, then the, uh, you have some direction in which you go down. Okay? So what this means is uh, that if I try to draw in a pictorial way the landscape, I have the energy of the ground state, which is here, in which I have, let's say, few minima, which have, okay, I have just one dimension, so the fact that they are very stable, I will <coughs> draw it in this way. And then if I go high in energy, I have more minima, which are, let's say, have, are still stable, but has direction which are a little bit, uh, I mean, less uh, sharp. Then I arrive to the threshold. At the threshold, let's say I have, I don't know how to do it, because I need at least two directions. So I have some direction in which is stable and some direction in which is flat, okay? And I have much more, okay? And then if I go to higher, then here, the critical points are subtle, okay? So they have direction which goes down. It's really horrible, this way of drawing, but okay. And then there is something else that you can know, again, doing this kind of computation, and it's not difficult to do, but we will, we will not do it, is that instead of computing the number of critical points, you can compute the number of critical points which has one direction which is negative. Okay, which I will call it N1 of E. So these are the ones in which all the directions are positive, there is just one which goes down. These are just saddle, which is called saddle of index 1. Okay, and now this, if I take the log and I divide by N, goes like this. This will be N1. Sorry, it would be, uh, yeah, log of N1 of E divided by 1 over N. And then I can do the same for the two, if I have two direction which goes down, three direction, k direction. So as long as k is finite, you have just had that this curve goes like this, and when k goes to infinity, well, it just it just becomes vertical. Okay. So with yeah, I'm coming. So what this is telling you is really the property of the landscape. So this means that if I look to this energy, typically critical points are minima, but still I have many which are rare, which are much less than the minima, but I have some which has direction which goes down, okay? So this allows you to characterize the energy landscape. And when I'm here, so I have very few, very stable, I go up and then at this point, and it's normal that actually they all mer merge here, because when I'm here now, I have many, many, actually I have an extensive number of direction in which I go down, okay? Yeah. Sorry. So n1 is n1 is really sorry. N1 is really just one. If I say at least one, then uh, yeah. Of n1, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's nominated by n1. Then n2 is exponentially is less than n1. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the picture that you have of the landscape. And so the, now the interesting thing is that this picture that you get here for the P-spin spherical mode, yes? So do you have to reach an infinite temperature for all the directions to be unstable, or does that have to define a temperature? Uh, no. 
So actually, I think, uh, so at the infinite temperature, so in the P-spin spherical model, is the energy zero? Uh, probably. Yeah, I think probably, like, I think at infinite, I'm not sure I should check, but I think at infinite temperature, you have half of the direction which goes down and half which goes up, I think. And you really have to actually to go to negative temperature to get all the good stuff, I think. Okay, so, I mean, look at this picture here, even if it's uh, just a drawing. The interesting thing is that this, which happens in the P-spin spherical model, actually, it happens in many, many other systems. And uh, let me write what are these systems in which it happens. And there is a reason for this. So in physics, I mean, there are several models. So there are these P-spin spherical model. But then, I mean, people have started to look at many other different systems. Maybe systems that, that are more realistic uh, model of glasses. So I don't know, for example, interacting particle system interacting particles on random graphs. And we know, even though the computation is not done like this, we know that this kind of picture works also in that case. So there are many, many, many models and models which are more realistic description of the say, supercool liquids in which you have this kind of pro statistical property of the energy landscape, in which you have the ground state, you have a threshold energy, in which you have this behavior of the uh, uh, number of uh, critical points. And it always, I mean, again, the, the value of E ground state change, but the qualitatively is always like this. Okay? And I mean, recently, again, not using these techniques, but if you do, for example, interacting particle system in the continuum, interacting particles in the limit of when the, the spatial dimension go to infinity, which correspond to the mean field theory, Again, you can show that you have this kind of picture, okay? Actually, well, it's more, a little bit more refined, but you have this kind of picture. You don't do it with these techniques, you do it with replica, but you get this, okay? So this, what I wanted to say is that really, it gives you a universality class of, let's say, behavior of random energy landscape. And as you will see also in, let's say, computer science, and this I will discuss more also by putting a temperature tomorrow, also in computer science, so for example, if you look to random KSAT, when K let's say, is larger than or equal to 4, I mean, this kind of property of the landscape are very important. And I think, I uh, don't know who is going to talk about this. If, well, okay, I will say a few words tomorrow, because tomorrow I will tell you what happens if I put temperature on this, or if we do dynamics, okay? Because now that you know that the property of the landscape is like this, then you can really understand things about thermodynamics and dynamics. Thermodynamics, I will tell you tomorrow. So I assure you tomorrow there will be no computation at all. It's just, uh, we just obtain things starting from this landscape. And then also from the dynamics. So the dynamics, for example, so if you look to this kind of landscape, imagine that I start from very high temperature. So very high energy in the landscape. So if I start from very high energy, if you look to the landscape like this, it's, let's say it's intuitive that I will fall in the basin of attraction of the threshold state. So the state which are the highest one still stable. Why? Because they are very numerous and they are very, let's say, let's say they are very shallow like this. So if I start from very high energy, I will start, I will start in the basin of attraction of these states. So, for example, if you look to the out of equilibrium dynamics, so let's say that you start from high temperature and then you quench the temperature very, very low. So the system, what we'll do, we'll do a gradient descent in the energy landscape and then very, very slowly we'll approach the threshold state and we'll show something which is called aging. And I think Leticia Cugliandolo will give you, uh, well, an entire set of lectures about this, but the fact that you find aging and the property of aging that you find in mean field model is really related to this, uh, let's say, description of the energy landscape. Sim similar thing, imagine that you look now to the dynamics, equilibrium dynamics at finite temperature. So if I'm at, let's say, high temperature, it's easy to move in the landscape because, well, I have no barriers, so let's. 
So if I'm here, I have no barriers, I have many directions which goes down, but I have the temperature that brings me up, so it's easy to move. Now when I start to go lower and lower, then I have many directions in which the energy landscape goes up, I have very few which goes down, dynamics becomes very slow, and then actually, well, when I reach a certain temperature, I will have a dynamical transition. Okay? And then below this temperature, then if you want the system to move, then you have to jump over barriers. And this, again, this, I think David Reitman will have, a, I think, a set of lectures in which he will explain the equilibrium dynamics in mean field system and the relationship with the glass transition. And again, what you find is, again, is what you will find in a question is just, a, let's say, a, is a related to this structure of the energy landscape. Okay? And let me maybe conclude with just a few words about the technique that I try to, then I, then I take the question that I tried to convey to you. So this technique actually has been used in recent years in many different, uh, uh, in, well, in several different fields. So in particular, well, a little bit, well, it's been used in spin glasses, but then it's also has been used in problem, which I think we discussed a little bit yesterday, in which you have random forces, which do not derive from a potential. And in, these are the cases which are important, for example, for ecosystem. They are important, for example, for neural networks. For example, if you consider neural networks and you want to count how many equilibria a neural network have, uh, then you can use this type of technique. So there is, uh, so there were the people that uh, did it is Tubul uh, in, in France. And I think they will be used, I think, in, in the future, for example, in machine learning problems. Okay, so that's also the, uh, then I take the question. So as I told you, uh, I suggest to you to try to do this challenge. If you try to do it, don't do it alone. Do it in groups because uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's good to, uh, uh, I mean, there are some, some parts which are difficult, but you, re you will really learn a lot. It's not at all mandatory for my lecture. I mean, I will not use it uh, again, uh, so you can do it whenever you want. Um, that's also, I take the question now. Yeah, I think so. Um, I never look at it, but yes, I think that it's in principle is symmetric. I think so. Yes, if you go to very no. Ah, if you just focus on the minima, yes, so you, uh, let me see. Uh, no, I think no, actually. So the, the fact is that, okay, let me tell you. So the fact is that if you ask, so here, if I ask to have one direction which is negative, then you have exponentially less in N thing. Here, if I ask to have one minimum, I ask actually to have a fraction of eigenvalues, which instead of being negative, they are all positive. You see, so I don't ask just one, but I just ask order n. So actually, the probability here to have one minimum is exponentially minus n square. So, okay, let, let me, I will tell you again. So this one here, if I just ask that one eigenvalue is negative, I drop of something which is l minus cn. But each time that I ask for one eigenvalue which is atypical, you see that I always drop of a quantity which is, let's say, here is minus Cn. Here, the, uh, the uh, density of eigenvalues is like this. So I have a, an extensive number of eigenvalues which are negative. And if I ask that all of them are becomes positive, this cost exponentially minus Cn squared. So actually, they are now disappear. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes.